So I'm going to talk about how a brain metastasis grow macroscopically um, and why it matters. So the title is slightly different from what you have in the program, but essentially it's the same content. But I think this one is probably more descriptive. And uh, so uh, it is very important to emphasize that I am now going from the micro scale to the macro scale. So I'm moving uh, up from the details of the cellular interactions and processes and pathways and so on to the whole tumor scale. So the kind of things that we use in the clinics uh, to uh, diagnose, to treat, to plan the, the treatment and to follow the response of, of metastasis. Because in fact, this is often the only dynamic, uh, so including time information that we have available in the clinics. So I'd like to, to, to look at these problems from a different perspective. Although finally I have to go back to the cellular details also. So before getting into it, let me get, uh, just uh, uh, comment on a couple of old results. And the first one is the uh, allometric scaling relation between body size and metabolism in animals. This was discovered by Max Kleiber one century ago. And essentially it says that if you get a measure of the size of an animal, say the mass or the mass or the volume or something like that, and, and you compute uh, or have a, a way to measure its metabolism, the relationship between metabolism and mass is a power law and the power, the spawning in the power is three quarters. And this uh, scaling law of holes for very different uh, types of animals for very different scales. Essentially, it means that as animals grow larger, they use energy more efficiently. The second thing I want to, to introduce is the, the very simple von Bertalanffy growth model. So uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, uh, 50, 50 years ago, he published this very simple law. This is very simple for physicists. I, I, I guess probably it is still a bit obscure for biologists, but anyway, it's a very simple thing. It's a first order differential equation. And essentially this relates growth speed with size. And it has only two parameters. So it's a very simple thing. So you have an alpha that is kind of growth rate um, and beta that is the growth exponent. And it is what it really matters. And essentially you have a system that is described by von Bertalanffy growth uh, low. If you get kind of a nutrient or resource limited growth, you get exponents beta that are typically smaller than one. And in the case where you have more or less uh, good uh, supply of nutrients and all cells can more or less uh, proliferate, then you get exponential uh, low is beta equal to one. And, uh, and of course there is another possibility that doesn't make any sense that this beta larger than one, because in fact, if you solve this equation and you set beta larger than one, you get explosive growth, you get a finite a singularity in finite time. That doesn't look biologically feasible initially. So it is very interesting that both things are connected. So the exponent beta in the uh, allometric scale law relating metabolism and size is the same exponent that appears in Bobertalanffy growth law. And in fact, in this uh, very nice paper published in Nature by West Brown and Enquist, they proved that if you uh, get uh, the well-known flavor law with uh, three quarter exponent, you get a growth law for growth law in time, for, I mean, from, from uh, birth to adulthood for different animals. And it really fits nicely available data. So there is a connection between metabolism and growth. And essentially, if you have flavor law, then you get a universal growth in, line, in time, growth low in time, okay? So now let's move on to cancers and to brain metastasis. That is the topic of this talk. So first about cancers in general. We uh, published last year this uh, paper where essentially we found that the allometric scaling laws in cancers are super linear. So beta is larger than one. That was quite surprising, but it was consistent uh, for different types of cancers, so breast cancers, head and neck cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, rectal cancer, gliomas, and so on. And that has implications for how tumors grow in time. And in fact, we were also able to find 
a, a small number of data sets of different uh, tumors growing without treatment, uh, ranging from low-grade gliomas, non-small cell lung cancer, and atypical meningiomas, and we found consistently exponents beta larger than one. The point out to uh, uh, accelerating uh, dynamics uh, uh, in time. So it seems that cancers have kind of super linear uh, dynamics. So this was already published. And in fact, for brain metastasis, we have also some uh, results on the brain tropic model that Mihailas was, uh, was uh, presenting just a couple of talks ago. Uh, it was Manuel Valiente who did the experiments. And uh, again, we found in these animal models, this uh, uh, super exponential dynamics. So, grow faster than exponential, so beta larger than one. So why is that? So it's, it's very difficult to understand why should the tumors uh, microscopically go, grow so fast? So what is the reason for that? So essentially it means that the growth rate is in continuously increasing in time. It is a bit difficult to understand at the, at the first sight. So we build a, a mathematical model, so kind of multi-scale mesoscopic stochastic discrete simulator. We work at the level of spatial voxels, and there we simulate different biological processes, cell proliferation, mutations, migration, death. We, we, in this example, I show the, the phylogenetic tree for um, uh, glioblastomas. So we have some probability of the wild type having these P53 mutations or mutations affecting the retinoblastoma pathways or RTKs and then combination of, of all of them. So you put all this biology in the, uh, in the model and then you get uh, evolutions in silico, of course, recapitulating spatiotemporal heterogeneity. And what it is more interesting is that you have uh, multiple clones or multiple genotypes, and, and this provides a ground for evolutionary dynamics. So you have poss possibilities of something that is worse just uh, popping out and growing and competing with the other clones. So as, fast, as far as there is a ground for evolutionary dynamics, you get super exponential exponents. So beta gets, is larger than one. If you remove uh, genetic heterogeneity from the system and just stick to a simple uh, genotype, even when it is uh, cancerous, it is proliferating, it is infiltrating the normal tissue, you always get beta numbers smaller than one. So we think this super exponential dynamics is the result of evolutionary dynamics within the tumor. And by the way, it is very interesting that evolution happens more likely close to the tumor boundary. Uh, so the tumor boundary becomes the, the, the hotter uh, uh, area of the tumor from the uh, uh, metabolic point of view. And in fact, that's something that you can corroborate using a lot of uh, molecular imaging data. And if you like this topic, there is also this paper about evolution, where does evolution happen in this mathematical model and uh, other things. But so let's go back to how do brain metastasis grow? So we wanted to, to uh, to know whether this super exponential growth also happened in brain metastasis. And so we started this MedMath clinical study. We included 350 patients. Uh, uh, and this uh, means more than, than 1,000 brain metastasis with all clinical data, diagnosis, you know, typical uh, molecular uh, diagnostic studies and longitudinal imaging data. We have many non-small cell lung cancers, some breast, breast cancers, and others. And uh, what you have essentially is, uh, first is growth before treatment. And uh, then you have a, what you expect is, is metastasis without treatment is growing. There you have just one example. And there you see the exponent in this case is 1.8. So it's, it's much larger than, than one. In there, you have another example. This is regrowth after treatment. So you have uh, radiation therapy, radiosurgery, and then there is first decrease in the tumor size, and then you have regrowth. And when you compute the exponent uh, upon regrowth, you get 0 0.96. So this is smaller than, than one or around one in this case. 
So if you do that for the whole data set, you get for untreated meds, the growth exponent is 1.48. And for treated metastasis, either with chemotherapy only, with radiotherapy only, or with combinations, you get uh, consistently uh, data exponents smaller than one. What does this mean? Okay, then this is another way of, of computing the exponents that is less uh, sensitive to, to individual errors. So this is group fitting. So we, we assume all, all metastases have the same exponent and fit the whole group of data that we have. And essentially we get something similar. Without treatment 1.5, with chemotherapy 0 0.5 and with radio surgery 0 0.7. Keep in mind that these numbers are numbers of the dynamics when the tumor is growing. So first growing without treatment, and this is growing after treatment. So even when beta is positive, so this means growth, but it's slower, substantially slower than exponential uh, growth. So what does this mean? Uh, this means essentially that before treatment, you have the possibility of having evolutionary dynamics because you have strong, uh, a, a, a huge or, or at least a broad variety of different uh, genotypes, you have also phenotypic plasticity, you have many things uh, down there, and that allows for, for evolutionary processes so that you have this beta larger than one. What happens after treatment is that you have reduced evolutionary capabilities. So you have a substantial reduction of heterogeneity. And this is why exponents beta are substantially smaller than one. So somehow this is a macroscopic uh, manifestation or what is going on down there? And because this is only uh, computed from volumetric measurements on the uh, magnetic resonance images. And it's a bit fun that the, only with three points, three measurements, you can know what is the evolutionary status of the tumor. And then this is uh, also, you know, just uh, more uh, simulations of similar uh, thing. Uh, as, as the mesoscopic uh, simulator I showed you before. Essentially, if you have a variability within the tumor, you have this uh, beta close to 1.5 exponent. And after uh, treatment, you have less heterogeneity. You typically get numbers that are below one. So it's very interesting because the growth exponent, that is something that in principle you can obtain just from the uh, patient images, and it could be a surrogate of the tumor evolutionary potential, and even could be used to guide a second strike strategy. It was uh, Bob Gatemi yesterday who was suggesting the possibility uh, of using the reduction of heterogeneity after first uh, strike treatments to, 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 uh, to design uh, therapeutic strategies uh, more, uh, maybe more aggressive or, 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 or are um, more effective, uh, keeping into account the, the goal of evolutionary extinction of the tumor. So this is very interesting because data could give you a hint on what are your chances of, of, uh, of defeating the tumor with a second strike strategy. So, and finally, it is very interesting that, that you can use also those exponents to discriminate radiation necrosis from relapses. This is a key problem in the clinics. You treat a tumor with radiation therapy, and after some time, you see that the tumor is growing. And the problem is that sometimes the tumor uh, regrowth as seen in the MRIs is a real tumor regrowth. And other times it is not a real regrowth, but just inflammatory re uh, reaction. And the problem is that if it is tumor regrowth, then you need to act promptly so you should go to a classical surgery, for instance, because ray radiation is typically not recommended. But if it is uh, radiation necrosis, then you should do, shouldn't do anything. Just wait, and, uh, and uh, there will be the, the inflammation will, will uh, go back spontaneously. And the problem is that radiologists currently they don't know how to uh, how to identify how to discriminate radiation necrosis from relapses. It is very interesting that if you compute uh, the beta exponent of radiation necrosis uh, events, they are substantially larger than those of relapses. And this is statistically significant. And uh, interestingly, if you just get two points, because to compute beta, we need three time points. But if you just get two points, 
you cannot discriminate between radiation necrosis and, and uh, relapses. It is not just a question of, of fast growth. It is a question of, of the shape of the curve. And you cannot get that with only two time points. And you know, this is very interesting because this allows to build a classifier based on the growth exponent. And this is a single variable. And uh, you know, it gives a reasonable area under curve of 0 0.74. Uh, you know, this is uh, good because this is something that radiologists can use in addition to their standard, uh, um, you know, tools to, to try to dis discriminate radiation necrosis from um, relapses. And what is interesting is that this is not obtained through the, you know, machine learning screening uh, or artificial intelligence study using 1000 variables, meaningless variables, but just using a single parameter that makes sense and that has to do with the radiation Cheta, with the ma. growth speed. Ooh, <laughs> so uh, we can do also mathematical models of why this uh, exponent uh, beta is so high and it is it's not complicated, it's just uh, uh, putting together the, the laws of inflammatory reaction and immune cells and necrosis and proliferating cells and normal tissue and everything you put all that biology together and you get consistently exponents beta um, substantially larger than one and close to maybe between two and three. That is what we have in the, in the clinics. So just to summarize what I told you about, uh, we have uh, uh, developed the MedMath clinical study. We incorporated 1000 brain metastases. And now we are, uh, we are going to a larger clinical study with, our goal is to, to get to 2000 in order to have more data. And we have all diagnostic data and longitudinal imaging follow up. And uh, the conclusions of, of the analysis of the data is that uh, untreated brain metastases have a accelerated growth with exponent close to 1.5, is uh, three halves. And uh, this is very interesting because it's a signature of uh, a strong evolutionary dynamics down there in the, in the, uh, at the cellular level. Interestingly, this is different from the five quarter exponents that we get in uh, metabolic uh, studies. So we don't know why. This is a good point for a uh, uh, theoretical physicist, I guess. And uh, so it is uh, interesting why METs are able to, to evolve so fast. And uh, we think that could be related to tumor plasticity. And by the way, the previous talk also was very interesting because pointing out also the role of tumor plasticity in, in, in this, because genetics uh, is not able probably to provide such a huge acceleration in the, in the tiny scale of a few months. So there should be something else. Uh, for relapsing brain metastasis, we got uh, exponents that are smaller than one. So visually you see growth, maybe fast growth, but the exponent is not that high. And this is as an indication of, of reduced evolutionary uh, dynamics and less heterogeneity after treatment. And uh, maybe we can use this exponent as a signature of, of a biomarker of evolutionary vulnerability or extinction probability. So this is something that has to be explored in more detail. And finally, this beta, uh, this very high beta around 2.5 for navigation necrosis events. Uh, that is a signature of treat treatment-induced inflammation, allows to discriminate radiation necrosis from relapses, what is something that I think could be also useful in the clinics. And in fact, radiologists are, are appreciate very much this, this result. So let me, to conclude, let me acknowledge the people, uh, the team that was working on, on this problem of, of uh, growth of brain metastasis, the radiologists in different hospitals providing us the data, the PhD students and the postdoc in our group, and also all people in the group uh, in the laboratory of mathematical oncology that uh, are helping in, in developing all of these uh, different research activities, and of course, our funders. So thank you very much for your attention.